Hi there, Megan Thompson here with Megan Thompson Coaching and today we are going to do a little uh, check-in on what it is that I do, reintroduce myself for those of you who are new here and uh, spend some time getting to know each other, <laughs> right? So uh, here at MTC, we help parents of highly sensitive kids eliminate the daily meltdown in as little as eight weeks. And I've been working in this field for over 14 years now, post-masters. And I felt like it was time for me to update a uh, introduction, if you will. So some of you might know who I am. Uh, and I wanna, I wanna start from the beginning. Uh, my mission, is uh, something that I'm very passionate about because I refuse for my children to grow up in the world that I grew up in and I refuse for my kids to grow up with the skills that I didn't have. And one thing that is so important in why we do what we do is because I also refuse for other children to grow up like my sister and the skill sets that she has yet to develop. So. Let's talk about that from a more specific uh, way and uh, we'll dive in, all right? So, um, you know, I'm, I'm a licensed clinical professional counselor, a registered play therapist supervisor, and I have been working in the mental health field for over 14 years. But my specific skill set uh, was honed in when I was younger. Uh, my, my sister is two years younger than me and we noticed her big emotions and her lack of emotion management uh, pretty early on um, in, in young childhood, around four, five, uh, even three, she was having pretty massive meltdowns. But I wanna speak about the dynamic that we experienced in our home. Now, my parents are just like the parents that I serve here at MTC, they are awesome. <laughs> <laughs> we have awesome uh, and they have awesome children and uh, my parents had awesome children I'd like to say <laughs> uh, we're all grown up now and it's it's important to notice that uh, my parents did the very best they could with the skills that they had uh, my mom worked in the helping field in the medical profession and uh, my dad worked in the um, the, the financial sector and accounting and so they were well educated and as boomers they didn't understand emotional intelligence it just wasn't something that was widely known right how to manage emotions that your perception creates your reality uh, the understanding of self-fulfilling prophecies how to handle anxiety the ability to recognize that when um, you experience something and feel a feeling, that doesn't have to be a fact, right? All of those skills are something that you or I likely have had the privilege of understanding and learning um, based on our assessment of, of the world and our education and, and also um, the, the fact that psychology uh, and the studies of, uh, from the field of psychology have been much more widely uh, shared with the onset of the internet. <laughs> onset, that sounds like a, a little bit of <laughs> an illness term. Those of you in the medical pro profession know what I mean by that, but um, I'm, I'm gonna digress here and, and move into, uh, in, in back into my focus. So, you know, it, long story short, my sister really struggled with her big emotions. We didn't know uh, why that was and so we blamed her and I say we because as a teenager and a young adult I totally participated in that willfully um, not not um, uh, not not because I, I wanted my sister to feel pain but because we didn't know at the time 
how uh, our judgments on her experience of the world was uh, impacting her and we really felt like she needed to get it together. Uh, we, I didn't understand, nor did my parents, nor did uh, my sibling and I uh, understand how my sister was experiencing the world and how that was different from us. And so we just believed that she was more of a crybaby, uh, too sensitive, too much, didn't understand why it took her so long to get out the door, why it took her so long to understand um, concepts and emotional concepts, why she wasn't able to follow through on um, some of the expectations that my parents set forth for us in a way that was much more independent uh, and why she really struggled with resilience all the way down to just not being able to handle a job in high school, um, feeling very stressed out and in being able to manage that on top of school, uh, whereas my, my other sibling and I were able to do that. So this was, uh, this was tough, right? Um, it was a tough experience growing up without the understanding of emotional resilience. Uh, because what I learned was to stuff my feelings. I learned to require other people to feel better in order to feel better. And um, I didn't know anything different until actually after grad school, uh, though I was teaching <laughs> emotion management skills in the form of basic coping skills, uh, to my clients, my teenage clients, as a young therapist, I didn't really understand what it meant uh, to see the world differently to and to be in direct um, uh, influence of my perception of my circumstances, my whatever was happening in my life, in my relationships, in uh, the workplace, in uh, my learning, in my education, and how my perception shifted the way that I could feel like I could achieve, as well as how I could foster uh, healthy relationships uh, personally. And so I was basically a product of what you see is what you get. You know, you get what you get and you don't get upset as well as um, uh, you need to suck it up and, and achieve no matter what, right? Um, growth and uh, productivity and success at all costs. And while that certainly wasn't a value, if you ask my parents directly, that, uh, that they wanted to teach, it was the value that I learned because we didn't understand how to dissipate emotion, how to decrease emotional experiences, and how to regulate emotions. None of us uh, really knew how to do that effectively. We only knew how to quote unquote, stay calm, or, um, uh, you know, compartmentalize our emotions. All right. So what happened? What happened uh, for me? Uh, why is it that it's so important for me that that I refuse that my daughters learn the same uh, skill set? Uh, why is it that I want my daughters to have a better skill set? And why is it that we teach parents to teach their children a much different skill set uh, now? Uh, because it didn't work. <laughs> Teaching suck it up parenting, um, using punishments, using language and lectures like I'm very disappointed in you. Um, you're better than this. You're better than your behavior. All of that uh, type of feedback that I received growing up was uh, shame-based and um, externally uh, focused on motivating me through other people's opinion of me, right? So this allowed me to want to strive for success in order to receive accolades, personal accolades, uh, and a sense of self-worth. So my self-concept was based in my achievements. Um, I was a good person if I got A's. I was a good person if people were happy with me. I was a good person if people liked me. Um, that turned into people-pleasing behavior uh, as well as a difficulty in managing conflict because I also learned how to suck it up and, and deal with angry people and, and parents who were frustrated or disappointed in me and uh, didn't regulate their emotions with that. So there, like I said, there was uh, lecturing involved that was really intense and uh, yelling. And um, as a result, I learned to stuff my feelings. I learned to stuff them. And then when you stuff your emotions, you eventually either explode or implode. So my sister did both. Uh, I tended to explode rather than implode. Um, and uh, my other sibling learned to only implode. 
So, uh, and this is typical, this is what happens. Uh, one of the three or all three types of paths are how people learn to experience their emotions when they're not taught how to decrease emotions like sand in an hourglass. Um, so for me, I would explode on either loved ones or behind closed doors at work. Um, and, and that was within reason, you know, never got fired or anything like that. Never had a rageful moment that was, um, aggressive or threatening, uh, but it definitely contributed to unpleasant, uh, work events, uh, at a restaurant that I worked at. People nicknamed me the Mad Meg when I was in the weeds is the term we use in the restaurant industry when you're really, really busy and it's hard to keep your head on straight. You have a lot of things on your mind, a lot of tasks to accomplish right away when uh, you're slammed uh, with a lot of tables to manage and food to come out and orders to put in and all of that. And a fair amount of that stress was self-induced because I wasn't able to manage calm in a storm like that um, and because I was was gripping the steering wheel in my emotional experiences. So um, holding it in, holding my breath, uh, pretending and putting on a smile, none of that is effective coping. So, um, and, and just taking deep breaths wasn't sustainable either because I could take a deep breath and vent at, behind closed doors in, in, the, um, in the restaurant, in the kitchen or whatever. Uh, but that was an emotional release that didn't actually move me forward outside of that event. It wasn't sustainable skill. It was survival based skill um, in that moment. And so um, this is this is the experience I had all the way up through grad school. And I, I had a conversation with a grad school, um, uh, my supervisor, uh, when I was venting uh, about a clip client that I had who was struggling with her traumatic experience. I was young. <laughs> uh, she had a lot of trauma going on in her life and I was really trying to help her as a therapist. And, um, I felt frustrated with the, with her, what I perceived to be her lack of change. Now, this is something that we see our clients really struggle with, our parent clients, with their children. When they're trying, 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 you might be working very hard to teach your child coping skills and you get frustrated, right? So what happened when I was depicting um, my struggle with my supervisor? I said, oh man, she really makes me mad. And he stopped me dead in my tracks and he said, no one can ever make you mad. You make you mad. And that was an eye-opening moment professionally because it was the first time that I ever learned that my emotional experiences were mine to manage. I didn't learn this um, in my childhood. I didn't learn this in my young adulthood. I didn't, and I didn't learn this until I became a professional therapist. So it makes perfect sense that if you are a, um, a teacher or a doctor or a nurse or an accountant or an IT professional, uh, and you haven't learned this, and you're trying to help your child manage their emotions, uh, then there's nothing wrong with you. You, it, It's not your fault. It's very likely that you weren't taught this in your childhood. And unless you've been to therapy yourself, um, it's very unlikely that you were taught this skill, right? That other people can't make you feel anything. You make you feel something. Your emotional trigger is yours alone, not only to manage, but also to reduce and to change. And you can build that skill. Now we teach our clients how to do that pretty swiftly because we work with, um, in, a, in a coaching standpoint, we work with dedicated parents who want to be able to create transformational change swiftly, uh, regardless of how they were raised in order to raise their children with emotional health and psychological safety towards becoming much more resilient in the world. And so when we teach this concept to our MTC uh, clients, we focus on moving forward from the personal experiences you're having in your home, rather than unpacking the reasons why uh, with nitty gritty detail and focus, um, as well as um, without um, an assumption that it's something that you're thinking about changing. You know, therapy really focuses on thinking about changing and really solidifying the, the decision to change. Now in coaching, we assume you have already decided to change, that you're unhappy, that you're highly effective in many areas of your life, including your career or converse, uh, communication, 
and uh, collaboration in the community and you feel stuck and frustrated in your home because you're not able to translate that skill with your parenting or with your in, in and see that result for your child to be able to demonstrate this with in their home in your home and this is why your child is having meltdowns and you recognize that so if that's you then keep listening right uh, this was an eye-opening moment for me in my career and it's why I feel so passionate about what we do and the fact that we do not operate in the, the mental health industry anymore to create change because a lot of the processes are actually not necessary, which means you can speed up breaking out of the meltdown cycle much faster uh, when you operate outside of a medical model to address the problem. So I want to bring you back to you know the timeline here. Um, I'm learning, right? I'm in my early 20s. And I'm applying basic therapy, coping skills, cognitive behavioral therapy to, uh, to helping severely traumatized kids. And it's not working. Why? Because their life is chaotic. It's very difficult to um, translate these skills for uh, family members or for, for teenagers or for adults who don't have chaotic uh, lives, let alone uh, children who, who have experienced domestic violence, who are moving homes regularly. This is where my career started. I was serving in the underserved population with significant trauma. And so uh, a more trauma-informed approach allowed me to have a much different pace of expectation of change for my clients, as well as uh, requiring education for, for my clients to understand why they were so feeling so disrupted internally. Their emotional experiences were so um, wrought with fear. All right. So I was educated, right, as all therapists are educated in their internship on how to do well in the field. And a typical therapist isn't actually effective until they've had at least five, if not 10 years of experience. That's when you become an expert. A subject matter expert requires 10 years of, of experience in your field, right? So um, uh, needless to say, young in my career, I was not an expert. I was not very efficient in my effectiveness. Now I was supervised, so I was effective, um, but it took much longer for me to get results for my clients because of my lack of experience. So I uh, continued to learn. I continued to raise my hand because I don't do anything um, half-butted, if you will. And I got excellent training from uh, multiple prof providers, uh, training providers in the field of DBT, in the field of trauma-informed play therapy, became a registered play therapist supervisor, learned and, and built all of my skill set in teaching young therapists how to become play therapists, and uh, in the meantime, trained parents directly to create therapeutic change in their homes while simultaneously treating their children for mental health issues. And while all of this was going on, I was still watching my sister struggle significantly emotionally. She was not able to build a skill set of managing her emotions. So she was consistently reactive in the workplace, consistently reactive in her relationships, and would fall into a trap of all or nothing. It's either somebody in my life is either all amazing or they are just not helpful and I need to cut ties with them. So she would really experience a lot of emotional strife in her relationships. Uh, she also developed anorexia because she was not able to control her environment. She started to control herself and uh, that led to over exercise, under eating and drastic weight loss. And I was actually the one who uh, implored her to receive therapy. My parents didn't notice it because they were with her uh, day in and day out at home. And um, in her young adulthood, she would come in, uh, come home on the weekends, even when she was living independently, because she just emotionally could not cope with being um, emotion emotionally independent, as well as financially independent and relationally independent. She did not have these skills in young adulthood. So while she was living outside the home and my parents were helping her pay rent, um, she she couldn't cope with being on her own. So she would come home to my parents. It was a uh, failure to thrive type relationship going on. Um, failure to launch, I should say, but also failure to thrive. Um, uh, failure to launch is the better term. 
but um, failure to thrive was definitely happening too. And because they saw her so frequently, they were too close to the problem to notice how bad it was. And I can imagine that this is something that you also recognize uh, as a parent, that your perspective of what your child's capable of has changed over time. If your child is, is having regular meltdowns multiple times a day or multiple times a week, uh, or, you know, daily even. And um, when you zoom out to think about how much your child has been struggling this past year, uh, it might feel very eye opening and also frustrating to notice how long it's been going on. Uh, whether your child is hitting or kicking or running away or screaming and yelling and making empty threats or trying to act out threats in the home, uh, this can be really, really frustrating, I bet. And uh, we've seen lots of families break out of that pattern, but it does take really hard strategic work. So I want to simultaneously encourage and help you uh, stay focused on turning this around for your family in my personal story. So um, my sister received treatment. She was able to reduce the significant symptoms in her eating disorder, uh, regain weight, regain muscle, thank goodness. And um, in all of that, sought professional support uh, from therapy. It was a long road and a lot of work, and yet she still never learned emotion regulation. Uh, it is my... Um, clear and certain assessment that the majority of the therapy she received was vent-based therapy. Let me tell you how last week was so you can give me some tips on how to prevent last week from happening this week. All of that is what I call crisis of the week therapy or crisis of the week coaching where the professional is just as reactive as the client is. And um, in that dynamic, my sister only um, was able to move out of what I call survival mode um, in her behavior, but not in her mind. Her mind was consistently reactive to the goings on uh, day to day. She consistently experiences her feelings as facts, um, and she is not resilient uh, even to this day, emotionally, financially, nor um, career career wise. It's very difficult for her to remain organized and out of overwhelm and, and, and therefore procrastination sets in when, when you're perfectionistic uh, or stuck in overwhelm. I'm sure you also um, uh, have experienced that in the meltdown cycle because that is a symptom we see adults experience uh, from, from the overwhelm of the meltdown cycle. Procrastination, avoidance of um, big tasks, kicking the can down the road with uh, paperwork that might be falling through the cracks or uh, big projects, trying to keep it all together, right? Now, um, what we do see when parents are stuck in the meltdown cycle who have a vision for shifting out of this dynamic is that they also just try to get it all done and then just collapse at the end of the night, right? So if that's you, uh, even if you are still getting everything done, you are still experiencing overwhelm. It's just in a more uh, forward focused uh, momentum based uh, manner than perhaps some of our ideal clients who are recognizing that they're stuck and don't want to keep uh, living this way. And so I want to highlight how this translates uh, from my sister's story to yours and my story to yours. Um, so enter, you know, it chronologically uh, several years down the road with this, all of this professional training and specialty, uh, enter in um, my understanding of why my sister was struggling by learning more about dialectical behavior therapy, which is an evidence-based treatment to support sensitive children breaking out of, sorry, sensitive, sensitive adults, primarily sensitive adolescents, and sometimes sensitive children, depending on the provider. Um, and their specialty breaking out of chronic suicide and self-harm behaviors. And um, one thing that we know about suicide is that suicide is preventable, right? Uh, it's also true that uh, self-harm and suicide has have increased over the years. 181% um, uh, self-harm has increased by 181% from 2001 to 2020. This is at the start of the pandemic is when the increase was drastically noticed. So the pandemic did not cause this increase. Uh, and it's also true that suicide was, was the eighth leading cause of death for children ages 5 to 12 in 2009 and the fifth leading cause um, in 2019. So it is drastically uh, moving up in level of lethality as well as uh, gr greatest cause for, of death for young children. 
And when we think about these growing rates of uh, self-harm and, and the drastic um, increase of uh, suicide for children, it is this is coming because uh, adolescent females are engaging in much more lethal means of suicide. Um, adolescent males uh, have typically led the uh, the demographic with engaging in suicide behaviors that has been um, use of um, uh, uh, I'm try of weapons that are more lethal, and adolescent females are moving in that um, in that direction rather than more passive um, ingestion of medicine out of out of uh, direction of a medical provider, etc. That um, typically allows for a greater amount of time to solve the problem and and you know pump the stomach, etc. Um, and, and decrease the lethality, but adolescent females are also choosing more lethal means uh, now. So um, like I said, suicide is preventable, so is self-harm, and we see lots of families whose kids are threatening uh, these behaviors, remove that threat and stop threatening uh, throughout the meltdown cycle with strategic action. And so there is hope, there is focus for you to keep listening. It is important to take this seriously. Children who understand um, that they can communicate about death uh, know much more about death than adults give them credit for. That is uh, purported in research by the CDC. And it's also true that suicidality in teens is highly correlated with family functioning. All right, so uh, we know that the meltdown cycle is related to uh, a decrease in family functioning. Your emotional state as a parent is really uh, very intense. You can experience a sense of inadequacy, frustration, overwhelm much more regularly. You may be yelling, um, engaging in empty threats yourself, threatening to remove privileges, for example. And um, you, and this feels crappy, right? And, and you know that you don't want your child to, to continue to learn from a reactive adult and so uh, your emotional experience might be also wrought with guilt or uh, shame. And when you're dealing with this, um, it's inevitably going to impact how you communicate with your child when you're not um, in at that worst case scenario state, uh, because there's just a low level simmering uh, anxiety or worry going on. Um, uh, when you're engaging with your child, and I call that walking on eggshells, right? Basically trying to keep your child happy in order to avoid the emotional intensity. And this is the experience that I created as an adult in my own personal relationships. Um, if everything was happy, great. If I was mad, you knew it. And um, this was not healthy. And this is one of the reasons why I learned how to manage my emotions. And coaching helped me do that. Uh, I did not learn that through therapy. I actually felt worse talking about my problems with, ther with therapists. And instead, coaching gave me the opportunity to learn specific and strategic skills, understand the psychology um, from a research-backed approach as well, uh, but stop sitting in the suck, if you will. <laughs> <laughs> uh, instead, moving forward, I don't tend to be a complainer. Um, and so it really wasn't a good fit for me to spend years and years and years talking about my problems, when what I really wanted instead was a solution. So it was much easier for me to deal with the insomnia that I experienced after learning that my child, my sister was anorexic. Um, uh, by speaking with a coach and coming up with specific and street strategic plans that allowed me to be accountable, like exercise and going to bed on time and advocating for myself when um, my then fiance wanted to, uh, you know, wake up early and I had a hard time staying asleep and, and you know, setting parameters in place for that. Um, and the work that I needed to make sure that I stayed um, focused on eating well and getting back to, um, to physical health was really important because the medical model wanted me to take sleeping pills. The medical model wanted me to um, kvetch about the experience and then feel bad about kvetching. It was such a weird, uh, talk therapy was such a weird, um, a weird dynamic for me. It didn't work. Um, 
uh, in, in terms of accepting the experience that I was having. Focusing so much on accepting the experience I was having actually kept me feeling stuck because I wanted to move forward. And so when we teach our clients to balance both accepting your child where they're at and helping them change simultaneously, Uh, that actually feels much more empowering. And it's outside of the therapeutic dynamic because typically there is a more um, uh, lengthy crescendo of accepting where you're at and feeling emotionally safe um, with the current problem that you're having and then leading to change. Now, in a coaching dynamic, especially with with how we teach our clients, we uh, speed up that process. We focus on both accepting and changing at the same time and finding that balance so that you learn how to validate yourself. Again, not blame yourself for not knowing what you didn't know and break out of analysis paralysis and and procrastination there uh, without feeling like you have to spend forever uh, psychoanalyzing why you got there in the first place, right? So, um, you know, think about it this way. An athletic coach isn't going to say, uh, let's, you know, uh, unpack and, and nitpick why your foot strike is landing the ball outside of the corner of the net. Um, let's just notice where you're stuck. Uh, stop blaming yourself so that you'd stop walking off the field and uh, give you the right strike so that you can get that um get that ball into the corner net uh, away from the goalie's hands, right? Like, let's do all of this in, in a couple of practices so that you can show it show up to next week's game uh, much more capable. And and that's the dynamic that, that really spoke to me and appealed to me as a professional and why I moved out of the medical model. Uh, because the medical model has a framework that it's going to take a long time to heal, whereas a coaching model has an understanding that you are fully whole. And so coaching with a licensed professional who has that experience uh, was was actually much more effective. You know, I worked with master's level, uh, master's degrees level uh, professionals as who were my coaches over the course of my own personal development journey. And that was much more satisfactory because while we weren't working in the realm of therapy, uh, because we were focused on strengths and, and with strategic and specific outcomes without necessarily... Um, you know, spending too much time addressing my childhood experiences and and uh, assigning labels to my experiences, we instead were able to move on from that emotional experience without compartmentalizing it. It's a different dynamic, a totally different dynamic. Coaching is compared and consulting is compared to uh, compared to therapy. Therapy uh, purports that someone is broken and needs healing, which makes sense for somebody who has anorexia like my sister did, or a major depressive disorder, or um, a bipolar disorder, or borderline personality disorder, and all of that, right? However, uh, generally functioning people in society move much more effectively back to their goals as a family uh, when you approach it from a coaching perspective. And so uh, for me, I just became much more of a coach to the parents of my child clients and then strategically moved out of working directly with the young child in order to stop uh, sending a mixed message to the parents that I was working with that their child was responsible for change. Um, Your child isn't responsible for change. You are. You are responsible for teaching your child that they can be responsible for change. Uh, we can't do that through lectures. We can't do that by um, by expecting your child to know how to feel better already. Your child wants to feel better. No one was put on this earth to be miserable, um, but your child doesn't know how, and that's that's where your job comes in. All right, so where are we now? Uh, my children know how to manage their emotions in an age-appropriate, developmentally appropriate way. I have a one-year-old, so she's doing the best she can, <laughs> one, to notice when she's upset and to and we validate her and we help her um, communicate and seek soothing and uh, find ways to, um, to move on from her emotions, right, in a healthy manner uh, without telling her everything's going to be okay right away because it might not be. Uh, but letting her know that I'm I'm here and uh, my, her her dad is here, her caregivers are are there for her, and experiencing the ability to cry and that that's safe and okay, right? We all 
likely did this. You all likely did this. Those are my listeners here. Uh, when your children were very, very young. And then as you continue to grow to impart that healthy attachment, it's likely that sometimes uh, you're actually counterproductive in the process, telling your child that everything's going to be okay, telling them that they need to suck it up, move on, because you got to get them out the door for school, or you got to get them to practice, or you want them to be able to experience their life and all that it has to offer. And this has led to you um, trying to find ways to move your child along Um, to demonstrate their emotions in a much more developmentally appropriate manner while also validating. And this can really be quite tricky. And so when we help our clients, our parent clients, learn how to build that emotional safety net in the home and really plug a lot of holes that are um, that are in the family dynamic that are actually keeping this cycle going, it actually is a lot easier for the child to demonstrate the resilience that they want to demonstrate. You know, children are very imaginative. Children have lots of hope and are very optimistic. But sensitive kids, when they can't see the path to make their optimism their reality, uh, they, they feel very dejected and sad and overwhelmed quickly, which is why they quit too early, or uh, they use overarching global statements like you're the worst, I'm the worst, it'll never work, I'm always a failure, etc. And that type of language that um, uh, that all or nothing thinking can really keep kids stuck. And uh, it's important as a parent to notice that while children developmentally will demonstrate that all or nothing thinking, uh, the severity of that all or nothing thinking is what needs to change. If, if a child says, oh, I'll never get this f- figured out, and then they stop trying, uh, that is not developmentally appropriate. That's a sign that your child, your sensitive kid is stuck in the meltdown cycle and they don't feel capable, which means they lack resilience. Resilience is a sense of capability in challenge, uh, no matter the challenge. And so what's really important for you to be doing is focusing on how you can encourage your child to notice the wins, how they can keep moving forward, fostering that growth mindset, helping your child accept themselves and learn to self-validate through your skill set of validating them and uh, moving them more strategically by a, by uh, eliminating shame-based parenting, removing um, any punishments that you're using, or lectures, which is also a punishment to sit and be talked at, right? <laughs> and instead engaging with natural consequences, because you're not going to need to save your kid from those either, uh, but also balancing what your child can handle based on their emotional needs. And and all of that is, is quite complicated, right? Teaching your child playfully how to accept that life is um, not always how they want it to look, but that they can emotionally handle that. They can do hard things. It, it requires specific skills for you as a parent. And we're happy to help you uh, notice whether or not what we do here at MTC will work for you. It takes uh, four different steps. First, you need to understand how your perception of your child is impeding your progress. I spent a fair amount of time focusing on that today. Uh, you know, we help parents break out of this pattern first by noticing uh, what assumptions they're making about their child and understanding the personality trait and how uh, the traits of sensitive uh, personality are different than the symptoms of the meltdown cycle. And then um, they're cha- changing your expectations on timeline that you can shift your child's big behaviors in a few short weeks uh, playfully. And uh, by focusing on uh, more about possibility and what your child is capable of rather than laser focusing on every single thing that is wrong. And that actually is much more empowering. So when you take an empowering focus as a parent, Uh, then you can much more effectively follow a strategy to break out of the meltdown cycle. And that strategy includes feelings, uh, games, playful communication about emotions, um, and then also teaching your child how to manage big, big emotional experiences in the moment uh, by helping them see that they are capable. And uh, that is our resilience rewiring protocol that we teach directly to our clients um, so that they can teach it to their children so that uh, as a parent, 
you can be focused less on eliminating bad behaviors or ineffective behaviors and more on rewiring your child's brain towards resilience. And again, um, that that type of an approach is a a paradigm shift for many. Uh, So it requires a lot of mindset support. And this is why we focus on ensuring that clients, our our parent clients understand uh, thinking differently requires uh, you to be okay noticing that you didn't know what you didn't know and uh, be willing to receive understanding how to change that, receive education as well as training on how to change the way that you think about childhood behavior, the way you think about your child's emotional expression, and uh, the way you think about what your child is trying to say to you through their ineffective behavior, their uh, defiance, their opposition. You might be using judgmental language like that and how you can move away from that type of language into a more needs-based language. My child is angry, doesn't know how to share anger safely and therefore is aggressive, things like that, right? Um, and, And that understanding has to come first before you can use tactics uh, to change the way that you talk to your child, to change the way that you hold your child accountable, and to change the way that you show your child uh, that they are capable of change. And um, all of that requires a specific oversight, right? Um, professional support is necessary for parents who are stuck in the meltdown cycle because it is difficult to change a family dynamic uh, with multiple children, multiple adults, stay on the same page. It really requires a neutral party that has a proven system. And so if you're interested in learning more about our proven system, you're ready to take the leap into shifting the dynamic that you've been uh, challenged with in your family's home in a much more strategic manner, then I encourage you to book a call with our team. Go to meganthompsoncoaching.com backslash talk or meganthompsoncoaching.com backslash teen talk. And uh, you can speak with our team about what you're struggling with, what behaviors you've been seeing from your child in your home. What are your specific goals? What what values do you want to impart for your child now and also in the very near and also distant future for your child's development and uh, where you've been struggling with fostering resilience so that you can see that your child is resiliently cha- dealing with challenges on a day-to-day basis by creatively solving their problems. If you want to be the one who is the change agent in your home, then uh, and and you feel stuck in navigating that, then I definitely encourage you to book a call with our team. Go to meganthompsoncoaching.com backslash shock. We'll talk all about how that would um, uh, land for your family, what our solution is, how we help, and if you wanted to work with us directly, how you could hire us to train your family in learning these skills and, and work directly with you as parents to do that for your children. And all of that can be, uh, that conversation can be held on one simple phone call. All right. So go ahead over to meganthompsoncoaching.com backslash talk or meganthompsoncoaching.com backslash teen talk. And